Hello, everyone. I'm Selena Vickers, and I'm from West Virginia. Very happy to be with you guys today and to uh, give you guys um, some information about how the Democratic Party um, is structured. Um, do you guys see, my, see the screen? Okay, excellent. All right, so um, I think that um, the Democratic Party, a lot of people think about reforming the DNC and reforming the party, but then how do you do that? Um, I think a lot of people kind of see the, um, the Democratic Party and the, and the DNC as being very, um, very esoteric and who are these people and where do they come from? And so what I wanted to do is uh, just shed a little bit of light on how the party is, uh, is structured. And that way, uh, as Mike was saying, if people would get involved, he mentioned precinct level, and a lot of, a lot of states do have precinct level. My state doesn't, um, but uh, we're gonna talk a little about, uh, about how this is structured and how to get involved. Um, and I am a big, uh, a big fan of just uh, fairness. You know, I, I don't care if the person um, that that is in is the most, you know, really progressive or really conservative, as long as they're fair. And they they set up a um, situation where people have an opera a fair opportunity to participate. So here, the National Party, the kind of like the hierarchy of the, you know, the most, uh, uh, where the most power is, is in the Democratic National Convention. And uh, the most recent convention had close to 5,000, uh, well, probably by the time they added on bonus delegates, about 5,000 uh, delegates. That's the highest authority of the Democratic Party, and it meets every four years. Um, the next level is the DNC, and we're going to uh, that's the, the big star there is because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about um, how the DNC is made up. But basically it um, governs in between conventions and it basically meets twice a year. Um, next is the DNC executive uh, committee, which, which meets four times a year. Uh, on paper, it governs between DNC meetings, but um, they, they rarely act they rarely actually do anything unless they want to undo something that somebody else did. Um, but it, it's a very powerful committee, but they tend to not do a whole lot. Um, and then you have the DNC chairperson who governs basically between uh, executive committee meetings. Um, so who, may, who, who are the people who make up the D, DNC? Basically, it is a big old bunch of uh, ex officio members. So people who are members by virtue of their position uh, that they hold in democratic parties or recognize democratic organizations. Uh, and we'll look at, at what those are in just a second. There is a very, very small number of people who are actually elected members. Those are the officers. Um, and just so, just so you know, those are the only people um, you know, who do not have to be, um, they, they don't have to be a DNC member to be an officer. Um, the, uh, and then there's also some elected slash appointed uh, uh, members. They're really, they're 75 or up to 75 um, at large members. Uh, they are officially elected, but basically they're, they're appointed by the chair and just ratified by the, by the DNC. So I mentioned here, this ex officio member they're the biggest bunch of them um, by the positions they hold in the Democratic parties. So these are state and territory parties. And then there's also Democrats abroad. So in the states, you have all 50 states. In addition, the um, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, for all intents and purposes, are considered states. So 52 state parties. Uh, and then the territories, Guam, Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and Northern Mariana Islands, those are the four territory parties. And then Democrats abroad are basically uh, people who have dual citizenship that, um, or they just, they're living or working in another country, but they keep their citizenship and they, um, 
they vote, uh, they send in their absentee ballots um, to West Virginia or Florida or New York or, or wherever, but they're kind of considered their own uh, very unique party. Um, and uh, so anyway, so that's a, that's, that's a total of um, 57. So whenever, that, sometimes they just refer to uh, the 50, 57 um, a state party, but really it's, it, th this is what they are. So there's 57. Now here's the, the ex officio aspect of it. So there are, if you are the chair of one of these parties or the vice chair, um, you are automatically by virtue of being in that position, a member of the DNC. So on our states and territories, uh, you know, so you have your chair and your vice chair um, is uh, that that's 52. And then you have two, but uh, the chair and vice chair are two. So that's 104 people who are members, automatic members of the DNC and your territories of those four you have um, your chair and your vice chair, uh, that's eight. And then Democrats abroad is, is a little bit different. They, um, they have, you know, their chair. Am I muted? Okay. Can you guys Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so good. Now. All right. I think uh, somebody accidentally muted me. Um, all right. So they are Democrats are uh, uh, different because they basically use half votes. So if you ever see uh, anything with a half vote, it's because of somebody in uh, Democrats uh, abroad. So they have a total. Now we have a total of 114 chairs and vice chairs with a total of 113 votes. And then you also have a. Uh, um, You also have um, your what they call DNC committee men and committee women, and you have in your states in your states um, you have um, a total of two hundred period, and then those are sort of like divvied up by Democratic strength. Uh, through the different states. So for instance, my state of West Virginia, which is very small, we only have two. We have a Democratic man and Democratic woman. The one who has the most is California. They have 33. And then somewhere in between is a state the size of Florida, which has 15. But all together, there are 200 there. In the territories, they get two each. So that makes eight. And then Democrats abroad, they have a total of six members with uh, half a vote each. So all in all, you have 214 committee men and women making up 211 votes. So now all together from your states, uh, when you add up your committee men and women and your uh, chairs and vice chairs, you have 304. From your territories, you have 16. And Dems abroad, you have eight. Um, eight people, four votes. So now we're up to 328 um, people. Um, now, the other type of ex officio members are made up of um, certain democratic organizations. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but for instance, um, uh, the chairperson of the Democratic Governors Association and two other governors. And those are chosen by that association. So three, basically three governors um, are, you know, are, are, are members of the DNC. And then they, they have different groups, the Federation of Democratic Women, Young Democrats, uh, the Democratic Municipal Officials Conference, I mean, things like that. So all, all together, that makes up uh, 39 uh, members. And I forgot to mention down in the right-hand corner, I don't have this on all the slides, uh, but things like this that you might want to refer to, um, I put down there in the bottom uh, uh, right-hand corner where you can go to, to look for that, in that this particular thing. It's bylaws, Article 2, uh, Section 2. Um, all right, so now you have your, your elected DNC members, um, and these, these people do not have to be chosen from the, this membership that they have, they have so far. They can go outside of that, and very often they do. I think almost all the time they do, but it's, you know, it's not required that they do, but they don't have to be DNC members. So you've got your chairperson, um, five vice chairs, 
uh, you know, your national finance chair, treasurer, and secretary. So all in all, you have nine officers and they are all voting members. And then you have, um, typically what happens is the chairperson selects 75 at-large members. Um, that is um, the, well, up to 75. So those are people like, you know, very often, you um, the, um, the, the, the chairs or private presidents of certain, of, of sort of like the big unions are, um, are included in this. Um, they use this somewhat um, to add diversity. If there's not enough diversity on the DNC, they can use these uh, positions to add diversity. Um, there are longtime members that have been around forever and they like help write some of the charter and bylaws. Uh, they like to keep them around for the kind of historical um, knowledge. Um, and so those are often in their uh, formal, former DNC chairs. Um, <laughs> no surprise, uh, you make big, big contributions. Um, to a Democratic president or the DNC, uh, sometimes you get an at-large position. Um, there are uh, quite a few lobbyists and consultants uh, lists, uh, that are at-large members. Um, and the bottom line is the people who are, who are in the, this 75 more than likely are very, very loyal to either the, the chairperson uh, or the Democratic um, president. So in practice, really what happens is, you know, the chair uh, selects them. Um, if there's a Democratic president at the time, um, they have a very, very strong influence over who these people are. Um, and even though the DNC does elect them, um, there's a slate and they, you know, basically vote, you know, yes or no on that slate. Um, it, it, in practice, basically, they're just ratifying um, the, the picks that the, that the chairperson made. So anyway, so that, that gives the, shows you down the right-hand corner where that, that's found. So now we have our total DNC membership. We have uh, uh, 114, um, you know, chairs and vice chairs, and then 214 uh, committee men and women. All that adds up to 328 people, 324 votes. And then um, we've got 39 uh, from those democratic organizations, nine officers, 75 at large, and all together 451 DNC members. I may have missed something somewhere, but I don't, I, I'm pretty sure I went through the charter and bylaws. I'm pretty sure that's, uh, that's the number. If it's not, it's, it's very, very close. Um, all right, so this is, this is what happens after the presidential um, election, uh, then uh, you have, uh, you know, the, you have, you have a president who is inaugurated soon after that, uh, you have the first DNC meeting of the, the new, the new season. And so the people who are at that time, um, the, you know, uh, the, the, the members of the DNC, um, they uh, elect a chairperson, uh, their vice, the, the officers, the, the chairs, uh, different chairs, a treasurer and secretary, who then are automatic uh, voting members. So these, uh, the, the, you have the outgoing officers that would vote and the outgoing um, at-large members who would vote. So that's at the first meeting. It usually happens in February. Sometimes it could be March. Um, but that's what happens at the first DNC meeting of like the new cycle. Then at the second meeting, which is usually towards the end of August, beginning of uh, beginning or mid September, uh, then they uh, elect the 75 at large members um, that are that are on that slate. So it's basically ratifying, but officially um, electing them. So then at that same meeting, they also uh, choose their new um, committee members. So they, um, again, this is basically the chair picks them and then they rat ratify them. But the executive committee, um, they, um, you know, the the exec the um, chair can uh, appoint 11 at large to those. The other ones are basically listed somewhere in the charter and bylaws as being members of the executive committee. They also choose a rules and bylaws committee. 
um, credentials committee and resolutions, all of these um, of the bottom three have about 30 uh, members. Now here's the important thing, all of the committee members have to be DNC members. They can't, they're not allowed to go uh, outside um, to, to get them. So all in all, here's a kind of like a, a, a view of the different types of DNC members. And you can see that the almost 75% of them are from the states and territories. You know, you have a little bit of your at-large and your officers and your DIM organizations, but a big old bulk of that is just from states and territories. So going to what uh, Mike said earlier, you know, getting involved in your, uh, in, in, uh, uh, even on the local level and moving up to the state level is how you can, ha you can influence um, your your state uh, party, and then you know, working your way up to then being able to really um, influence the, the DNC because the bulk is from uh, from the states and territories. And here's just showing uh, how often they meet. Uh, the DNC uh, meets basically twice a year. They usually show up on a, a Wednesday. They may or may not have a meeting on Wednesday. They'll have some type of reception in the evening. They'll meet, uh, have committee and caucus meetings on Thursday and Friday, a little bit Saturday morning, and then they'll have uh, like their main meeting for the DNC on Saturday um, maybe, maybe starting around 10 or 11, they'll go, you know, through mid afternoon and then break and then go home. Um, the executive committee meets four times a year, twice with the DNC, um, when the DNC meets and then two other times. Uh, the same thing with rules and bylaws, except during uh, delegate selection, or if they need, have an issue they need to address, they will uh, meet more often. The rules and bylaws committee is by far the hardest working committee. I mean, they meet a lot and they do a lot and they have like two day meetings. I mean, it's a very, especially when they're doing delegate selections, a very, very intense um, um, type, type of work that they do. Uh, credentials uh, committee usually just meets twice uh, a year. They can, if they have a reason to meet, they might meet more. Uh, and those are with the DNC at the same time the, the full DNC is meeting and the same thing with the, uh, with the re resolutions committee. Here is a typical schedule if you ever, and I would encourage people to go. Uh, usually one of them is in DC and then one of them is like somewhere else. Um, uh, and they kind of rotate that second one around. Um, but this is sort of a, a, a general idea of what a schedule would be like. Um, I would, if you go to these, what I would encourage you to do is go to rules and bylaws committee meetings. Um, then credentials, then executive, and then resolutions, and then other things certainly uh, participate in, but, uh, but those are the, that, that's where all the important stuff happens. Um, here's an actual, you know, schedule of things. You can see they have different councils and caucuses and different things like that. They have their, their receptions, whenever they have a reception, uh, everybody's, well, that's, a, that's an open event, unless it, they specifically say, but you can go in and you can talk to the DNC members. You have something you wanna talk about, you can go in and talk to them about it. So um, again, you know, we have an, uh, a, a, if you, if this is something you wanna fix, um, get started in your own um, state and territory. Um, so looking at how the, you know, the different states and territories are structured, um, they're <laughs> like everyone that I've looked at is different. There are certainly some, some similarities, um, but um, uh, basically there are, uh, you know, mechanisms for being on, being able to be on the, whatever the state governing body is considered the central committee, executive committee, whatever. Um, and they have, you know, mechanisms for electing their chair, vice chair, committee man and committee woman. And again, every state party has, um, has at least one, one of each that are DNC members. Um, so you can get involved, um, uh, you know, Mike mentioned precinct level, my state doesn't have that, but we have a county level you can get involved with, but my county level has nothing to do with the state executive committee. Um, and the, uh, but we do have like regional, um, 
ways to get involved to 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 run, which directly involved uh, is involved with state executive committee. And I'll give you an example of how that works. But the bottom line is there's there is a way in every state and territory to do it. You just have to read the, the bylaws and figure out how to do it. So I'm going to look at we're going to look at two uh, options. And I'll be honest, I don't know Florida nearly as well as um, uh, I know uh, West Virginia, but this is just, I'm just going to give a very brief overview uh, based on just pulling up their bylaws uh, and reading them. So Florida has 67 counties and they do have precincts. So you can run for your, uh, for your precinct level. And then uh, the precinct, the people who are elected from their precinct to, to, to represent their precinct um, on the county committee or on the county level, um, then they choose two people, which they call their state uh, com committee man and woman. And so they pick two people, and regardless of how big your county is, Every county has two people that they send to uh, the state executive committee. The, in, the, the difference is, is they're, very, they're weighted votes. So in other words, um, the two committee um, men and women from uh, Miami-Dade County um, have uh, you know, much, much, much more uh, voting power than somebody in a very uh, small rural county in Florida. So they have weighted votes. They also have ex officio members, which is basically they're, if, they're, if they're governor, lieutenant governor, um, senators, house delegates, things like that, not house, house of delegates, I'm sorry, house representatives are Democrats, then they are automatic voting members of the state executive committee and they have a weighted vote. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But all of that makes up the uh, state executive committee and then they also have a central committee, which kind of runs things uh, between uh, state executive committee um, meetings. So here's an example of how they do the uh, weighted uh, voting. And I, this on the left is just a screenshot from, uh, from the Florida uh, charter. Um, so you can kind of see here, uh, governor, when a Democrat has 7% of the votes cast by state committee persons, uh, the lieutenant governor, when a Democrat, 2%. Um, if you're in uh, the state cabinet, um, uh, state cabinet, uh, 6%. If you're the speaker of the house or minority leader, 2% president of the Senate or minority leader of the Senate, 2%. Um, if you're a, a U.S. Um, member uh, of the Senate, 4%. And if you're in the House of Representatives and a Democrat, 3%. So you can see if you have a, a, you know, a lot of Democratic, um, that level of leaders, they have an enormous, um, enormous amount of power over and influence over the executive committee, not just in their position, just being hit what their position is, but also um, just having their weighted vote. And then here, I'm not gonna read this, but this is sort of the um, description of how they come to uh, what the, uh, the weightedness of these, um, how they get to that percentage of these committee people. Um, but anyway, that's their, that's their state executive committee. So, um, and then here is uh, another example, which is you know, very different is West Virginia. So West Virginia has uh, 17 Senate, state Senate districts. And just so you know, um, in this pink one, uh, Senate District 10, which is made up of four counties um, and um, every uh, the pro in the midterm primaries, we elect two men and two women from each of those 17 uh, districts. So over here, I just have one, two, three, four. And then you know, if you would imagine that going on through 17. So two men and two women, and that makes up a total of 68 Senate district members. And then they elect three at-large members uh, this is brand new, by the way, this, this part of it. Um, we just got new bylaws um, in March. Uh, there are now six uh, diversity at-large members that they elect. Uh, they also have a slew of officers, like, you know, 17, I can't remember exactly, uh, I think it's 17 officers. And then they also have ex officio members like the uh, president of the Young Dems, president of uh, Democratic Women, um, 
the county chairs association president and then the Democratic leader in the House and the Senate in the, the state House and Senate. Those are all uh, automatic ex officio members, as well as the two members of the um, Affirmative Action uh, Committee. So we have you know, several at large, but these are not weighted votes. If you are on the executive committee, you have one vote, period. Um, and then when you're on the state executive committee, you're on for a four-year term. And you, I think the um, in Florida, you're on for a four-year term as well. So that gives you an idea of the different ways that different states are structured. And um, the important thing that I need to tell you, if you're interested in this, what you do is whatever state you're in, you just, you know, you, you live in, um, you know, Missouri, you just Google Missouri Democratic Party um, bylaws, and they should be there uh, uh, on a, a PDF. Uh, if they're not, then contact your state party, ask for a copy of the of uh, the, the most recent um, charter and bylaws. You have every right to have that information uh, and you request that, and then you read through it. Sometimes it will refer to state law, sometimes in West Virginia state law, kind of dictates how our state executive committee members are elected. So you might have to refer to state law a little bit, but there, but for the most part, it will explain how to become uh, a member. And if they have precincts, it should um, explain that as well. Uh, sometimes you can go to some people who, uh, friendly people uh, who've been around for a while and ask them how the process works. Uh, I would encourage you to always follow that up with looking up the that the, the, the paperwork part of it as well, because sometimes uh, things are done by tradition uh, and, uh, and they're not right. I mean, that I've seen that uh, multiple times. It, it's a, it'll put you in the right direction, but you should always sort of like, okay, well, let me read the, read the, the charter and bylaws myself and see where that's at. So um, the other thing I wanted to bring your attention to is the charter and bylaws of the the the, the national uh, party, the national charter and bylaws, and I think um, when I first started on this journey, I really thought that, and I was um, somebody who uh, fu very fundamentally disagreed with super delegates. Uh, I thought they were undemocratic. Uh, that was disrespectful to um, to regular people who were voting, and um, I sort of started on my journey to um, you know reduce the influence, if not eliminate, uh, superdelegates super um, completely. And so, in my mind, I sort of thought um, that you know the the charter and the bylaws. Uh, of the Democratic Party is probably all bad, you know, and the fact of the matter, it, it, it's not. Uh, I've been extremely surprised as I've read this document multiple times. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff in it. I'm not saying the superdelegate stuff is good. I, I don't, I disagree with that. There's some really good stuff. And I wanted to point out some of the stuff. Um, like in, in the very opening, um, one of the things that it says, and this, I, this is just incredible to, to me, we acknowledge that a political party which wishes to lead must listen to those it would lead. A party which asks for the people's trust must prove that it trusts the people. I mean, how, how different does that sound from what, what um, we are used to often with, with the DNC? Um, but anyway, that, but that's, that's, that's in there, you know, and that should be the, um, that should be the, the goal of the DNC. And hopefully one day we'll have people on the DNC will, that will recognize that and, and listen to that. Um, another thing that I want everybody to know, and I think Tom either is doing today or did yesterday a a piece on know your rights. I mean, and, and here, here, here are your rights just, Right here, this is Article 2, Section 11 of the bylaws. Um, the, the, the national, state, and local, local, and local Democratic parties, um, they have to have affirmative action programs, um, and those programs uh, need to be designed to encourage the fullest participation of all Democrats in all party affairs. 
And then it gives the definition of what all party affairs is. It, it, it means all activities of each official party organization commencing at the lowest level and continuing up through the National Democratic uh, Party. And then it gives these like very specific activities, you know, um, it, it at, such activities shall include, but not be limited to processes in which delegates are selected to the national convention. Yes, we knew that. Um, but also where party officials are nominated or selected, party policy, platforms, and rules are formulated. So what that means is you if you are a Democrat and you want to participate in the party, you have a right to know when meetings are, if they are going to be considering a document or new bylaws or new policy, you have, an, you have a right to know what that is. Um, you have a right to go to meetings. You have a right to request to speak. They, you may, they may not let you speak, um, but you have a right to know who the people on that committee who are going to be making the decisions are. You have a right to contact them to say, hey, I, I, I noticed that you're considering this bylaw to reduce the, um, the notice from, um, you know, two weeks notice to five days notice. And I really disagree with that. And this is the reason uh, that I disagree with that. People need, I'm just making this up, people need, you know, people who work, uh, sometimes need to give two week notice um, to be able to participate, you know, to take time off or to arrange for childcare or something like that. So five days notice doesn't allow for uh, for participation. And I want you or my representative, you're on my county committee or state committee or whatever, and I want you to oppose this. You know that that is representative participation, and um, and that's the system that the Democratic Party is is based on this representative system, and so you have every right to do that, and it, it, and I, I very much want people to know it's their right, and to um, what was that um, what was that how that song put it uh, you know like speak up you know even even if people get mad at you. Um, who, who cares if people, who, who cares if somebody gets mad at you? Um, if it's the right thing to do and you want to participate, you should, I mean, I'm not for being mean to people, but there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I, 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 I'm a Democrat. This is my committee. And I would like to know what's going on and I would like to participate, um, you know, and I think it should be done respectfully. But you have if people tell, you no, and that's none of your business, then push back. And there is a process for pushing back. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Let me see what I'm doing on time. I better hurry. All right. So the really, really great things in the bylaws, uh, things in particular. Here's the, the documents, charter and bylaws, um, the charter article eight. Um, has a whole, an entire article on full participation. A lot of that has to do with affirmative action, making sure that young people and um, black people, uh, Latin people, Asian people, people with disabilities, um, LGBTQ, um, I don't, I'm forgetting all, all the, 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 um, particular diversity groups right this second, but that um, basically um, if you are, uh, like, for instance, youth in West Virginia make up 26% of the people who vote for Democrats. Uh, therefore, um, Article 8 says that there should be a program in place um, to provide for that representation. So how are you going to get to that? And it has to have specific goals and timetables. Um, and then these other groups have that as well. So there's a whole section on, on the importance of full participation that's really, really good. Um, and then, of course, I read to you um, article, uh, bylaws, Article 2, Section 11, uh, which is about participation in all party affairs. That's my favorite part of the bylaws, and I encourage everybody to, to read it. There are other party rule documents that you should know about. Um, one is the, the call to convention. Um, the the, the new ones aren't out yet, the ones for 2024, but uh, often there is a lot of similarity. So if you want to know what these uh, are about, uh, reading the 2020 ones would give you a sense of what that's like. And then, of course, you know, before the 2024 
election cycle, the, these will be updated. Um, so in the, the, this is called the call and the delegate selection rules. Um, and there's other party documents uh, as well, but those are two important ones. This is a policy, policy statement. I'm sorry it's so small, um, but this is about the six basic elements of an open party. This, this is a, an official policy statement. Uh, and even though I have charter, uh, charter Article 9, Section 8 down here in the bottom, these aren't listed in the charter, but it does, that part of the charter says that the DNC can adopt these policy statements. And this particular one, it's been updated some, but this was uh, adopted in January of 1968, right before the 1968 uh, convention. And it came out of uh, the Mississippi Freedom Delegation to the 64 Convention, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer giving her famous speech uh, um, about being, um, you know, basically kept out beaten, uh, kept out of uh, participation. And so that the that convention and what came out of that convention was a special equal rights uh, commission, which made the recommendations to, to have these uh, these six uh, basic elements, and then later on, the state parties were required to include this in their um, in their in their charter and bylaws. And just so you know, they were at one point in the West Virginia um, uh, bylaws, and they are not anymore. They they have been systematically struck out. So um, that would be something to look for in your. Um, in your turn bylaws. Um, all right, so I'm down to, I've got three minutes and I uh, just have some things here about how rules are created in a democratic party, which is basically, um, there, there's several different ways to do it. Um, but almost always it's either done at a convention where the convention passes something or through um, commissions or through the, uh, the, the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Um, here are some of the commissions that have happened over the years. I mean, really, really important stuff, some good, some bad has happened through these commissions. Um, the 2016 was a Unity Reform Commission. And this sort of, uh, we don't have time to go through all of this, but, you know, th but there is a process that by which we decided, I was a, um, a delegate to the convention, but we created this commission and then the commission made recommendations to the DNC that went to the Rules and Bylaws Committee and they decided how to, uh, how to use that information. So the last thing I just wanna mention briefly is what to do when rules are broken. Uh, I will tell you that um, uh, what I have discovered is the problem is not that there's not good rules. For the most part, the rules are pretty good. The problem is they're not enforced, or if they are enforced uh, by the DNC, they're uh, they're enforced based on uh, political reasons, uh, who they want to to go or who they want in. Uh, so it's not it's not a fair process. It's a very selective process based on political reasons, and that is pretty disgusting. And there's a, a way that you, you can file challenges. There's different types of challenges. Um, you can read them about those in the delegate selection plan. There's also credentials challenges. Um, there's other violations you can uh, that that can be addressed um, towards the bottom of Article Two, Section Eleven. Um, their information. Almost all challenges are time sensitive. You only have so many days to do it. You have to have certain jurisdiction. You, have, you might have to have other people uh, sign on to you with a, a notarized, but you know that we could do a whole uh, two hours on challenges, but just keep in mind that there is a process uh, to do that. And then um, you know, people think about national conventions as just, a you know, for the nomination of the president and vice president, the fact of the matter, and, and they, they want us to think that, but the fact of the matter is the national convention is the ultimate um, uh, power in, in a DNC. And um, so having good people be delegates and being, um, being very structured and um, being there not to wear stupid hats, but be there to do business, um, some really good things can happen. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna stop sharing. I don't know if there's time to take questions, um, but I'm glad to, to do that. Um, I hope that that's been helpful to at least like give you an overview of the DNC and hopefully how to, um, how to be involved.